Hello and welcome to my video. My name is Cami and I am a chronically online college student and this is my video for my Philosophy 8 class. This course explores the world's major religions and their origins, history, and significant ideas. This is my alternative assignment for Module 5 where we discuss Taoism. Also, as always, all of my sources will be listed in the description box below if you want to do more research. Taoism is, again, another religion that focuses more on practices over beliefs, has many scriptures and deities, and is extremely popular worldwide. Taoism, which is more than 2,000 years old and still popular today. There are at least 20 million Taoists, and perhaps even half a billion living around the world now, especially in China and Taiwan. They practice meditation, chant scriptures, and worship a variety of gods and goddesses in temples. Taoists also make pilgrimages to five sacred mountains in eastern China in order to pray at the temples and absorb spiritual energy from these holy places, which are believed to be governed by immortals. Taoism is deeply intertwined with other branches of thought, like Confucianism and Buddhism. Or as Dr. Glorian concluded, quote, Taoism is the water course way. It is the way of leading people without being aware they are being led." End quote. Today, I will reflect on the significant features, basic terms, and common concepts of Taoism. I'll also explore the Tao Te Ching and its central message. And I'm going to discuss the impact of Taoism in America. Taoism is a religion similar to Hinduism, Buddhism, and Native American spiritualities in that there's no one monotheistic deity, but rather many teachers and many scriptures and lessons to learn. At the core, there is, quote, a sense of a great and mysterious force, end quote. This is similar to the great mystery in Native American spirituality or Brahman in Hinduism. And like these other religions, a major feature of Taoism is the belief in a cycle of rebirth and ultimate liberation. Due to this, it's easy to assume that ancestrism or ancestor reverence, is also common in Taoist philosophies. Many of these early religions we've discussed share a belief that, quote, the people we love who die can influence our lives for better or worse, end quote. That is why it's imperative for them, the people who have these beliefs, to respect their ancestors and maintain peace through rituals and rites. One of these rituals is being buried in a certain way to be reborn in the afterlife. The metaphor that Dr. Glorian uses is a seed, uh, how a seed can't sprout flowers unless it's appropriately been planted into the earth. Strangely enough, we've also seen similarities in customs between Chinese Taoists and Egyptians. These customs regarding burying wealth and material possessions with the deceased, especially if those deceased members were of a higher rank or of, of a higher class. I found this particularly interesting because we see this practice even in contemporary funeral rites. At least in my experience, when my grandfather died, we placed notes, playing cards, cigars, poker chips, and rosaries to be buried with him in his coffin. The contemporary belief mirroring the past that if we're buried with our worldly possessions, we'll carry them with us to the afterlife. So this religion is called Taoism, but where is Tao? What is Tao? Well, Dr. Glorian says, quote, the Tao is the unity in which all things dwell, end quote. This belief is foundational to Confucianism and Taoism. The differences between these two beliefs primarily revolves around the perception of how to work best with the Tao. Quote, Confucianism places the emphasis on rationality and sobriety. Taoism puts the emphasis on openness and intuition, end quote. Though it is common to see most people, especially in China, using both approaches together in order to seek a balance. And in a way, I relate to this because I'm highly skeptical, as I'm sure you've noticed by now. So I've not fully committed myself to one religion or belief system. Instead, I've kind of mixed and matched different religions' beliefs into my own bespoke spirituality with a little of this, a little of that, incorporating different aspects of the belief systems I've studied or participated in. Similar to most of the other cosmic religions we've studied so far, the Tao is understood by, quote, studying its manifestations within oneself and throughout the world of nature, 
which included the search for an ideal society, end quote. I took an interest to this section because of the connection between Buddhism in that part of achieving liberation is to share your knowledge and teachings in order to build a better, more ideal world for everyone to live in. As I mentioned at the beginning, Taoism has many scriptures and teachers that are fundamental to the practice. I only have time today to talk about one scripture and a few influential teachers, but let's get into it either way. The main scripture I'll be discussing today is the Tao Te Ching. Before I go any deeper into the messages in the Tao Te Ching, I want to share a clip from the School of Life's YouTube video provided by Dr. Glorian about Lao Tzu, just so that we can all understand who or what he was. It's difficult to know much for certain about the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. Even his name can be a little confusing. It's also sometimes translated as Lao Tzu or Lao Tse. Lao Tzu is said to have been a record keeper in the court of the central Chinese Zhu dynasty in the 6th century BC and an older contemporary of Confucius. He may also have been entirely mythical, much like Homer in Western culture. Lao Tzu is said to have tired of life in the Zhu court as it grew increasingly morally corrupt. So he left and rode on a water buffalo to the western border of the Chinese empire. So, as they mentioned, Lao Tzu is credited with the writing of the Tao Te Ching, but it very well may have been a collection of authors. And I thought that was interesting because in my mind, I instantly thought of the Bible, specifically the sections that are the letters of St. Paul to whomstever. Did St. Paul, formerly Saul, actually write these letters or was it more of like a letterhead? sent from the office of St. Paul from my administrative assistants Priscilla and Aquila. Either way, there's no real way of knowing, and so the question fascinates me to no end, and I love thinking of the endless possibilities of what it could have or could not have been. Now, the central message of the Tao Te Ching is difficult to pin down specifically, and Similarly to all of the texts we've studied, many different people have had many different perspectives and many different interpretations of the central message. I found it intriguing that, according to Dr. Glorian, scholars are still debating on this text and whose its intended audience was. Quote, was it meant only for individuals or for society as a whole? Was it meant only for hermits leaving the world behind them? Or is there a practical use for all people? End quote. And I feel like this general idea could be debated about in regards to most spiritual texts. But the reason there's so much debate around the Tao Te Ching is because it's just simply, it's a deeply paradoxical book. And an example, quote, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. Like, what does that even mean? This idea is so deeply confusing to me in the same way that in Islam, uh, forbidding the depiction of Muhammad or other prophets, that, like, why? How can you speak the Tao and yet it not be the Tao? I don't know. And look, I know I'm supposed to be reflecting more than recapping, but for this next little section, this part of the essay, man, it spoke to me so loudly, and I feel really compelled to share it and why. Dr. Glorian offers some help with this confusion and offers some understanding by saying that we need to quote, remember that words have limitations. They are finite. And in spiritual terms, such as the Tao, represent the infinite. End quote. He goes on to explain that we live in a word-oriented world, and because of that, it's hard to remember sometimes that words are just symbols. But when these words get labeled as sacred, people will maim and murder one another just because the word they are convinced that the words told them to. Dr. Glorian continues by saying, quote, we need to use words gently. That is, we use words while at the same time not taking them too seriously especially when describing spiritual reality. This might be why some of the greatest teachers, such as Buddha, Socrates, and Jesus never wrote anything down. They probably understood that once words are put in writing, they become fixed in stones and people become inflexible about them." End quote. That is hands down one of the most profound things I have ever read in my life. And it also really makes me think of hardline like fundamentalists who believe that everything that's written in their scripture is factually accurate, all the teachings are true and right, 
and there's no reason to take any deeper interpretation than the word. The belief that the God's word as written in the Bible is law, which must be followed with no deviation, is just one way to support the idea that especially when written down, words are finite, but have massive implications to post-rational thinkers. Another important thing that I learned in the Tao Te Ching is that Taoist philosophy, in contrast to Confucianism, is focused more primarily on nature than society, which the hippie in me loves. Quote, nature is the place where we see the Tao flow effortlessly, end quote. This quote, in my mind, connects to the video uh, Wu Wei, which is defined as Wu Wei means in Chinese non-doing or doing nothing. It sounds like a pleasant invitation to relax or worse, fall into laziness or apathy. Yet this concept is key to the noblest kind of action according to the philosophy of Taoism. The way never acts, yet nothing is left undone. This is the paradox of Wu Wei. It doesn't mean not acting. It means effortless action or actionless action. It means being at peace while engaged in the most frenetic tasks so that one can carry these out with maximum skill and efficiency. Actionless action, a state of flow. I talked about a state of flow in my first video about reaching that state of flow. And I want to go just a little bit more in depth because I could talk for hours about flowing, as I call it. When I first pick up my hoop or my poi or whatever prop I'm playing with, there's a little bit of a routine. I do some drills, I kind of stretch my body and warm myself up and I kind of just get into the feel of the music. I improv a little bit. I mean, the whole thing's improv. I don't practice any routines, but there reaches a certain point where I'm not, this sounds so crazy, but I'm not in control of myself. I'm just letting the hoop and the music tell me what I want to do. And I'm following it and, you know, the hoop and my body and the world around me tells me how to move and where to go and what to do. And I think that maybe this is an example of me practicing Wu Wei and reaching, like I said, a state of flow. I think that's really interesting. Now I want to briefly discuss Matsuo Basho, a Buddhist monk and poet who was born in Japan in 1644. We're discussing him here instead of in Buddhism because he was a Zen Buddhist, which Dr. Glorian explained in the essay was a marriage of Taoism and Buddhism. As a child, he was a nobleman's servant, and this is where he learned how to compose haikus. Haikus, as I know them, are a poem with three lines with corresponding syllable counts. The first line is five syllables, the second line is seven syllables, and the third line is, again, five syllables. They're described differently, though, in the video as... Traditionally, haikus contain three parts two images, and a concluding line which helps juxtapose them. Basho composed a great many haikus in his life, and his most famous is... Old Pond, A Frog Leaps In, Water Sound. This is the best-known haiku in Japanese literature, and it's called Old Pond by Basho himself. It's all deceptively simple, and when one's in the right, generous frame of mind, very beautiful. So, similar to the Buddha, Basho spent many years as a wanderer, but unlike the Buddha, however, he preferred solitude in nature over the company of others. However, Basho grew melancholy and often shunned company, and so, until his death in 1694, he alternated between travelling widely on foot and living in a small hut on the outskirts of the city. Basho was an exceptional poet, but he didn't believe in the modern idea of art for art's sake. Instead, he hoped that his poetry would bring his readers into special mental states valued in Zen Buddhism. His poetry reflects two of the most important Zen ideals, Wabi and Sabi. Wabi means satisfaction with simplicity and austerity, while sabi means an appreciation of the imperfect. It was nature, more than anything else, that was thought to foster wabi and sabi. I found this interesting because it's an uncommon mindset amongst artists and writers, but this sharing of a mindset is familiar to me with Buddhism, Hinduism, and other cosmic religions in the way of sharing an appreciation for the natural world and the universal mysteries around us. So we've talked about Lao Tzu, we've talked about Matsuo Basho, and the final significant teacher I'm going to talk about today is Sen no Rikyu, who was born in 1522 in what is now Osaka, Japan. And he is most known as the creator or, well, the reformer of the traditional Japanese tea ceremony. I think before we continue any further, it's important again to make the distinction between Eastern and Western philosophies. And I think the video on Sen no Rikyu does that very well by saying, 
In the West, philosophers write long non-fiction books, often using incomprehensible words, and limit their involvement with the world to lectures and committee meetings. But in the East, especially in the Zen tradition, philosophers write poems, rake gravel, go on pilgrimages, practice archery, write aphorisms on scrolls, chant, and in the case of one of the very greatest Zen thinkers, Sen no Rikyu, involve themselves in teaching people how to drink tea in consoling and therapeutic ways. He became fascinated by Zen Buddhism, apprenticed himself to a few masters, and took to a life of wandering the countryside with few possessions. Zen Buddhism was founded by travelling monks, who believed that people best could find spiritual meaning not by thinking complex thoughts or performing great deeds, but by doing often very simple things with intense... These differences speak to the differences between merely having or sharing a belief and practicing your beliefs through daily tasks and rituals every day in order to reach a greater consciousness and understanding of the world around us. My other takeaway from this video was when they further described Sen no Rikyu's Zen philosophy. Rikyu's prescription for the ceremony extended to the instruments employed. He argued that tea ceremonies shouldn't rely on expensive or conventionally beautiful cups or teapots. He liked worn bamboo tea scoops that made a virtue of their age and bamboo flower vases like this one which he carved himself. Because in Zen philosophy everything is impermanent, imperfect and incomplete, objects that are themselves marked by time and haphazard marks can, Rikyu suggested, embody a distinct wisdom and promote it in their users. This made me instantly think of the study of archaeology and anthropology. The older an object or fossil is, the more we can learn about our past environment, the individuals who live there, and what their habits, behaviors, traditions, cultures, and maybe even what their beliefs were. When archaeologists make these discoveries and share their findings, it in turn grows the general public's overall understanding of our historical and ancestral past. Rikyu seemed to already have some sort of understanding of this idea long before we started digging up fossilized human culture. I think this notion also speaks to the representation of a well-worn catching mitt. It shares a demonstration of a skill, practice practiced well and for a long time in the fraying seams of the mitt. The older the mitt, the more significance it has to the individual playing as well. What I like most, based on my reading about Taoism, is that it's more concerned with questions than with answers. And it also believes that the ultimate goal to strive for is to seek balance. Quote, so much of our lives can be taken up with trying to control people, places, and things that we can drive ourselves crazy, end quote. I relate to this a lot right now because I am, at the time of writing the script, currently trying to juggle my very work-heavy classes, writing six different scholarship and grant essays, applying and looking for jobs, helping my grandma at home, planning a move and a transfer in a couple of months, and planning a trip in two weeks to look around at schools and houses to prepare for that move and transfer. And and it's getting crazy stressful and it's already been crazy stressful and I've already caught myself in the six weeks of this semester spiraling about it maybe a few too many times. This spiraling causes me executive dysfunction in the form of paralysis as the onset and if I don't manage it quickly and properly I can and will cause myself to become ill and bedridden for like a week. And I have a few pre-existing factors that contribute to a weakened immune system so stress really does a number on me and I always make it worse on myself because I rarely give myself enough time to properly recoup and recover. Though after reflecting deeper on this, I greatly appreciate Dr. Glorian's potential remedies. Quote, sometimes it helps to get in touch with Taoist perspective and remember we have very little control of the outside world and so our energy might be better spent doing something else. End quote. The influences of Taoism in America is more so than I originally would have anticipated. While the practices are limited in their influences, the beliefs and ideas have subtly had a much larger influence. Dr. Glorian explains that most of us here in America are interested in one way or another in alternative medicines, such as yoga, acupuncture, cupping, as well as the use of medicinal herbs in tinctures, foods, or other forms of medicine. He also says he places a lot of hope in what he calls integral medicine. Quote, this medicine will be practiced by those who want to combine Western and Eastern understanding of health so that the best of both is made available while the worst of each is eliminated. 
end quote. And I like that he's coined a term for this practice, as it's something I've done, but I've never had a name for. I limit my doctor's visits to only when they are necessary, such as scheduled checkups and emergencies. I also try to limit the amount of prescription and over-the-counter medications that I take, and I maintain my health through many Western and Eastern practices. I take vitamins, I use medicinal herbs, I do yoga, I used to participate in acupressure, acupuncture, and reflexology, and I enjoy other homeopathic remedies like like aromatherapy or steaming and sweating out sicknesses. Unfortunately, as we have seen with all of the religions we've studied so far, and I imagine most of the religions we will continue to study through the semester, Taoism also faces some challenging aspects. One challenge it doesn't face as much as other religions we've studied so far that I think is important to mention is its attitudes towards women as Taoism focuses primarily on the yin or feminine, rather the yang or masculine energies. And with this, there have been lots of cases where women have been able to participate in the church and even become leaders, to a limited extent, of course. But anyway, these challenges that we see, these are the same that we see in all religions, like I just said. And I agree with Dr. Glorian's position that, quote, religion gets blamed for what is ultimately not a religious problem, but a human development problem. We find the same situation outside of the various established religions as well as in them. End quote. He then uses the example of our country having such a difficult time living up to our own founding documents and secular ideals. He continues on. <laughs> God damn me. He continues on by saying that because of the unstructured and open design of Taoism, some of the worst beliefs and practices were allowed and in some cases even promoted. And he asks us to consider, quote, how many people wasted their hopes and resources paying for fortunes that were lies or for amulets that did not work. How many people spent their life savings on miracle cures or heightened hope for immortality that was promoted by the unscrupulous, end quote. And weirdly enough, I mentioned a thought that similar to this a few weeks ago in my reply to another student's reflection. What I had said was that no matter what sector or field you find people, religious, political, medical, educational, what have you, you're going to find radicals and extremists. As long as humans are not truly influenced by the deeper message of our respective teachings, love and compassion and cooperativeness, I don't think we're ever going to have the tangible utopia that so many great thinkers strive towards. And on the other side of that same hand, we will always see desperate, vulnerable, and often gullible people searching for help and for answers. And there will always be a predatory MLM, televangelist, or snake oil salesman who will promise rewards to you if you only first just please contribute to their net worth. What we need to do is we need to seek a balance and make sure to approach all things with clear vision and mind so as not to get roped in to pre-rational hysteria. We need to be like water, weak and submissive enough to flow like a river, but hard and persistent enough to erode stone. Thank you so much for watching my video. This was so fun to research and make and I took so much away from the lessons this week. And I don't think the video is going to be too long. I think I've gotten a lot better at condensing. But I hope I recapped, reflected, and explained in a way that hopefully you can understand and maybe even learn from. As I mentioned before, all of my sources are going to be listed in the description below, and you can follow any of those to start your research. As per usual, I highly recommend you check out the videos listed below. You never know, you might get into an interesting rabbit hole. And as always, a huge thank you to Dr. Glorian for allowing me to create assignments that help me better learn, understand, and engage with the course materials. And with that, the video is over.